And on Father's Day, that's what we talk about. It's acts of love. On the day of the act of love, we bring the kingdom come. If you are going to be at church on June the 29th, that would be a great idea because Annette McCauley is going to be sharing her testimony in the 915 service. It is worth getting up early and coming to. She will you'll be glad you're here. She is also has a great testimony. Uh, Mission Samaria South is upon us. That's July the 12th through the 19th. If you've not paid, you can do that. Uh, and we will get that taken care of. We'll be loaded up, packed up, heading out soon. And going to make an impact by showing Christ's love in Mobile. So it'll be a good time together. Today is Father's Day. So let me say Happy Father's Day to you. Many of you have already wished me Happy Father's Day. Thank you for that. Melinda and I, a few years ago, attended a seminar by Tim Kimmel. And it was about raising children. At that time, our children were much younger. And, you know, we were in desperate need of help. We were only slightly desperate now. But desperate, desperate need of help then. Uh, as he was talking, Tim Kimball, he told a story about when they were on a trip once, and his children were in the back seat misbehaving, being wild. I don't know if you've ever been with your children in the car where they were being wild. Uh, that can be uh, exciting, to say the least. So, mom kept saying, y'all stop, 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 behave, 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 those kinds of things. Finally, dad interrupted and said, if you don't listen to your mom, I'm going to pull the car over and spank you. Serious thing. And after about three or four minutes of behaving, they went back to their regular habits. And sure enough, as the car hit the brakes, I'm sure they became believers. <laughs> Pulled over the side of the road, he spanked the children, put them back in the car seats, all that kind of stuff, gets the car, says, I don't want to hear a word from you for the next 30 minutes on this four-hour drive to granddad's house. Not a word. So for the next 30 minutes, the kids are completely quiet. They get to granddad's house. Granddad runs out. The kids get out of the car. First, he gets out. Everything's fine. Second, he gets out on the one shoe. And dad says, where's your other shoe? He said, it fell off when you were spanking me. You told me not to say a word. <laughs> so the shoe's on the side of the road. Now granddad asked, where's the kid's shoe? I pulled him on the side of the road and had to beat the car out of him. You know, so we lost the shoe. So now granddad's mad. Makes for a good day. And he makes for a great story. I'm glad he told us that. If I could, there we go. Fell off when you were spanking. Charlie Shedd is an accomplished writer and speaker. He used to give talks under the title of How to Raise Your Children. Many people flocked to those talks, wanted to know how to raise your children. They came in droves. Charlie then had a child, took a few months off from speaking, and the next time he gave that talk, he said the title was Some Suggestions to Parents. Two more children, and a number of years later, he was calling his talk Feeble Hints to Fellow Strugglers. And finally, after several more years, he came up with this topic. Anyone here got a few words of wisdom? <laughs> <laughs> they full circle. I love it when people who don't have children tell you how to raise yours. Or people who are broke tell you how to make money. Or people without education tell you how you need to go to college. Stop. Just stop. Anyone here have a few words of wisdom? We're fellow strugglers. So now when I go to those kinds of things, I take notes. I need to know all that I can. And sometimes we feel like that, don't we? We feel like is there's somebody out there with some wisdom that can help us. And sure enough, there is. We can look into God's word and gain wisdom that we need for raising children to be godly men and women. Now, I want you to notice four things with me today from the Word of God. This is a topical study, so if you'll kind of look through the Bible with me, these different passages, you can jot down some notes there on the outline that you've got. First of all, I want to talk about dads have a duty. For I, too, was a son of my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me, and he said to me, Take hold of the words of wisdom, with all your heart, keep my commands, and you will live. Now here is Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, talking about his childhood days, growing up there in the palace with his dad. When he was a boy living there with his father, King David, King David took time to teach him. Now David was the second king of Israel. The reason that's important was because the kingdom was expanding.
expanding rapidly. David was in lots of battles, lots of fights, conquering more territory. And during this time, he was busy. I wish I could tell you how many people give the excuse, I busy. You know, that's just not going to hold water in heaven. I mean, that's just not going to wash. Yes, we're all busy, but everybody has the exact same amount of hours every day, don't they? So it's really not about being busy. It's about how we use that time and how we use it for God's kingdom and God's business. So here's David. He's out fighting these battles. He's having to attend to administrative duties as the king. He has ten wives. He's got lots of children. He has lots going on. Exhausting, to say the least. But he had time to teach his children. Each dad has that opportunity. Some take it seriously, some slip it off. But we all have that opportunity. When our children were much younger, uh, several of the boys on the, my boys' baseball teams uh, would act up from time to time. And I, I remember one particular time we were traveling home after practice, and uh, one of my boys asked me, Dad, why do those kids behave that way? What's up with that? I mean, they understood that they were not allowed to behave that way, so they were wondering why other parents were allowed their children to behave that way. You understand how it is when a six-year-old and an eight-year-old ask you a question. You have to try to explain it in real-world terms that they can understand. So as we were going home, we began to talk about it, and I tried to explain to them some of my personal story. Now, you've heard my testimony. You know that my dad was in prison, so he was not there at ball games. He was not there at practice. He was not there. So that being said, I tried to explain to them that no man, these children, we knew them, no man gave them any time. I mean, they didn't have a dad on the scene, an absentee dad like I had. So no man was there to give them their time. No man was there to hug them. No man was there to pick them up and toss them in the air. No man was there to wrestle with them in the forest. And now tonight, when we get home, we don't have something to wrestle in the forest. So they will never have that. There's no man that gives them that kind of time. No man carries them to bed at night on his back. Remember when they were little and you used to do that? Prop them in the bed, blow with them, snuggle with them, those kinds of things. I said, they don't, they don't have a man's attention. I said, this is their way to get a man's attention. They misbehave. They act out so that somebody will notice them and talk to them. Dads, you and I need to take advantage and take this duty seriously. Are we teaching our children that we're too busy? Now, there are legitimate times when you can't prop everything you've got to do and go catch fireflies with them that moment. But on a regular, consistent basis, do we give them our time? You see, nothing should be more important than raising them. I mean, they should be the priority. And when I say nothing should be more important, you've got a commitment to Christ, then your family, then the local church. But show them how important they are. Teaching them by your action. Or you'll be teaching them by your inaction. Dads have a duty. But dads also have authority. Look what the Bible says. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. So that it may be well with you and you may enjoy a long life on the earth. Dads have authority given to them by God. Your mother didn't give you this authority. Your wife didn't give you this authority. God himself gave you this authority. This concept of honoring our parents is not an option for children. Now, how many of you here are somebody's child? <laughs> Everybody's somebody's child. So, you know what? You are to honor your mother and father. You say, but, but I've grown. I make my own decisions. Uh, look at the verse. It does not say honor your father and mother until you're grown. It says honor your father and your mother. That is a lifelong commandment. So honor them. Honor your father and your mother. When I was a youth director, I taught this pretty seriously. And I had a young lady come up to me one night after Bible study and begin to talk to me about something she was very concerned about. The more we talked, the more questions I asked, the more serious we got. And finally we got to the bottom of it. We realized this child was being molested by her father. And no matter what else is going on, you stop everything you're doing and you deal with that. That's serious. That had to be dealt with. So we took it through the proper channels that we had to go. 
please do not interpret this and have a King James Version that says, children obey your parents in the Lord. Please do not interpret that to be that you have to do what they say even if it's sinful. You do not. You do not. There is a higher authority than your parents, and it is the Lord God himself. So just know that we, we honor God first, we honor our parents. Long life is a promise for that. So honor them. But just in case uh, some of the young folks might not have understood what I was talking about, uh, let me say what they can understand. It. Cleaning your room does not violate in the Lord. <laughs> it doesn't. Doing your homework does not violate in the Lord. Be home by 10.30. Everybody else needs to stay out till midnight. You're not everybody else. You belong to me. I'm responsible for you. <clears throat> and as my mother used to say, if everybody else stuck their head in the fire with you, and so every now and then, it's funny to say, yeah, I tried. No, you would. Don't be doofus. We know better than that. So it doesn't violate. How about this one? You cannot date until you're 17. That does not violate in the Lord. And neither does you may not hang out with, be friends with, go off with, so and so. They are a bad influence and you cannot. That does not violate in the Lord. Now, if you have any questions, come see me. I'll talk to you and I'll be honest with you. Now, you won't like it when I'm honest with you because what you won't be saying is you don't have to obey your parents. But the scripture clearly teaches to honor your father and mother. All right. Third thing that I want to look at today. Dads have a delight. The Bible says, delight yourself with the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. You know, it's a joy to be with our children. Mine are all grown now, as you know, senior college, senior high school, with two in between. But I was amazed when we had our second child that I could love my second child as much as I love my first child. I, I, I didn't think that was possible. How, how could that happen? And then a third child, you think, there's more love. This is like amazing stuff that God just gives you enough love for all of them. So it becomes testament to God and His amazing love for us. How that love is unlimited. And I was also amazed, just like you were, at how well I wanted them to do. How I wanted them to succeed in everything. Now, do you remember helping your children learn how to ride a bicycle? That's always fun. Hold it, Daddy. Hold it, Daddy. Hold it. Let it go, Daddy. Let it go, Daddy. <laughs> All right, hold it again, Daddy. <laughs> you know, you have to go through that learning curve of hitting the ground. Understanding that even once the training wheels come off, trying, trying to learn those things. But we wanted them to do well. When our kids were in football or basketball or baseball or dance or tumbling, you know, all the stuff that we go through, we wanted them to do really well. That's good. So when we start thinking about that and we start thinking about God giving us the desires of our heart, the key is to take the light of the Lord first. Then, he gives us the desires of our heart. We can't swap those. We can't say, God, here are all my desires. Give me those, and then I'll take the light of you. That is not the way it works. So dads must be passionate for God. They must be more passionate for God than they are for the children who will in basketball and football and karate and dance and stuff and all that kind of stuff. They must be passionate for God. And then God gives us the desires of our hearts. Now listen, God wants the best for your children. They're actually his children and they're alone to you for a short while. If you don't believe it's a short while, wait till they get grown and you'll say, where did it go? It is a short, short while. So what matters to God? Do, do dance classes matter to God? No. Do buildings, do retirement plans? No. People matter to God. Your people, your children matter to God matter very much to God. So it's necessary for us dads to spend time with God to get his thoughts, to get his attitudes, to get his actions in us so that they can see God in us and be drawn to him. Delight yourself in him and then he'll give you the desires of your heart. And he desires more for your children than you do. His plans for your children are better than your plans for your children. So delight yourself in Him. You know, to sit around the table, every now and then we, we get to be together as a group, and to sit around the table and listen to your children discuss the things of God, that, that's a blessing that I could not have imagined. I mean, to see them with their own faith, 
not our faith in them, but their own faith and how they're wrestling with the Word of God and wrestling with life and going through those struggles and just watching and listening. It is a blessing that I could not have imagined. It was well worth all the sacrifices that we made. Well worth that. And, and I'm grateful that uh, we got to make those kinds of sacrifices. You know, for years, a lot of our friends would be out on their boats or, you know, doing other recreational stuff and we'd be home. We didn't have any money for that. Homeschool kids, pay taxes to go to school, and then bought books. You know, you know, all the expense that goes along with that. But now I feel like I'm reaping the reward. I'm getting all that back with interest. And it is well worth it. Well, well worth it. Then I want you to notice the fourth thing with me. Dads have a special task. Fathers. Now notice it doesn't say fathers and mothers. It's just dads here. That's because we're really good at this. Dads. Do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Sometimes, when I read this verse, I want just to yell, God, they exasperate me. <laughs> Where's a verse for that? <laughs> children don't exasperate your parents. But let's dig a little bit deeper into this particular verse and see what it's talking about. The word exasperate comes from a compound word with the prefix, which means to walk alongside. It's like when you're at the mall, there are two or three of you, how you kind of walk in a line so that you can talk and visit. That's what it means to walk alongside. Then, the second part of the compound means to anger, to enrage, or to exasperate. So the meaning is to walk alongside of our children and cause them to be angry, cause them to be enraged, cause them to be exasperated. Have you ever noticed how children are different even when they come from the same parents? Wow. I mean different different personalities, different body styles, different learning styles, different everything. It's just amazing. But they are. Uh, some children do not like to be tickled. I can't imagine that with some of them. Some children do not like to play sports. Some children do not excel academically. Some do, some don't. So why would a parent, particularly a dad, put great emphasis, come alongside that child, put great emphasis on that if that was not their bent? Train up a child the way that he should go when he's old, he will not depart from it. Uh, that idea of train up is like an archer when they take an arrow out of that bag and they fire it. That arrow, every arrow, has its own predetermined skew. Left, right, up, down. None of them fly perfectly straight. It's just the nature of creating things. Especially in Bible days when they were made out of wood. I mean, fire glasses changed a lot of that. Fake uh, uh, ends on it, you know, with feathers. You know, they, they helped that a lot. But none of them are perfect. So, if you have a child that when you fire it, that child kind of goes to the left and you want to hit the target. You know what you have to do? You have to aim a little bit to the right. If that child tends to go down, then you've got to aim a little higher so that they hit the mark. You see, the responsibility becomes ours to know the children and to adjust our learning, I mean our teaching style, to their learning style toward their bent. Some children are more prone to lie. Some children are more prone to steal. Some children are more prone to be prideful. So you see that there's a negative side of that, the sinful side. If you know that, you have to teach. You have to correct with that in mind. So while a parent, go up beside a child that didn't like to be tickled to tickle them. Don't frustrate them. Why would a parent put pressure on a child who is not inclined academically to make straight A's or you don't get to do this, 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 this? When the best thing to do is a B. Why would a parent come alongside a child and exasperate them and say, you're going to be the star quarterback. I don't care if you do run a 6 5 40. That's really slow. You know, uh, you know, the line would run faster than that. You're going to be the star. No, you're not. If you're not athletic and fine, it's not going to happen. Why would you put pressure on them to do that? That's how we exasperate our children. Their bid is to the left, and then we don't adjust. So they miss the mark. 
failure after failure after failure after failure. Because we can do our part. I, I mean, there's a whole lot to this parenting thing. And I know now that mine are grown, I'm going to get a lot smarter. I'm going to have this thing figured out. <laughs> so it's tough when you're in the midst of it, but as they get bigger, it's a little bit easier. So here's your challenge. Discover what they like, discover their bents, discover their talents, and then adjust to meet their needs. Go with them to the debate if that's what they like. You say, I can't stand debates. I didn't ask if you like debates. I asked you to go with them if that's what they're good at. Go with them and help them find scholarships and apply for grants if they are academically inclined and can do well and will do well. Don't just leave it to their own and say, well, I could get funding so I can't go to school. I mean, that's where we come alongside and help them. Bring them up with the training and the nurture and the admonition of the Lord in the areas in which they adjust, they excel. And then make adjustments for them. Uh, as a matter of fact, follow the example of Jesus. Would you say that Jesus made some adjustments for us? Like leaving heaven when you're the king and being come, come and being born a pauper? You don't have a place to be born, no house? Wow, you're in a stable? You mean like when you're the king and you don't even have a place to lay your head? Wow, those are some serious adjustments. And then to become sin when you did not know sin in order that those might become who are sinful might become the righteousness of God. Now that's an adjustment. So be like Jesus and you make the adjustments. I read an article in Life about teenagers experimenting sexually, and I'll put the quote up here for you. This article said that teenagers who leave traditional sexual concepts of heterosexuality identify, excuse me, heterosexual sexual identity and move to homosexual identity have a lot in common. This is what the article says. Mom and dad are key players in that. One report states 100% of the research participants stated that their father slash father figure was distant, uninvolved in their upbringing, frightening, and unapproachable. 87% spoke of a mother who was close, controlling, and overbearing. Parents have a lot of influence on children. A lot. So let's make some adjustments to them. But here is what I know from the Word of God. God made one man for one woman. That's how God did it. I didn't set this up. God made it that way. So God made men for women. One man for one woman. That, that's the way he made it. Now I understand that most of us have issues in our families. I understand that. We do. We have lots of sinful in our family. But do you understand that's not God's plan? And we can make it God's plan. God made one man for one woman. So Dad, you have a brief window of opportunity to dramatically impact your children. Too soon, they will know it all. Can I get an amen? Too soon, they'll be telling you what to do. You're just dumb as dirt. Too soon, they'll be influenced by their peers. Too soon, they'll be too cool to talk or listen to you. Please make the most of every opportunity that you have. Now, when we were having children, at one point we had three that were just barely four and under, or whatever the exact age was. I think Michael turned four in August and Stephen was born in September. What that means is you spend a lot of money on pampers and hoogies. We bought pampers from 1988, 1989, when he was born, till 98, 99. <laughs> and we bought them for 10 solid years. A lot of money in pampers. You know, we don't buy pampers anymore. We make some adjustments. But you do what you have to do in any segment of life. Okay? So understand that Dad made these adjustments. The window may seem that it's shoved open and that it's never going to close, but it closes rapidly. When they get grown and you look back, the years get gone, and they get gone quickly. Here's the good news. Jesus is the God of new beginnings. What you've done in the past, where you failed in the past, that's in the past. You can make adjustments, you can make corrections, and you can begin to move toward God. You can begin to become like Him. You can't change your 
goal in one day, but you can change the direction in one day. You can choose to start going towards that goal. I want to be more like Christ. I want to have the thoughts of Christ. I want to have the mind of Christ. I want to have the attitude of Christ. You can change that today with a decision, and then over the next 30, 40, 50 years, move in that direction to become like Him. You'll be surprised how that impacts your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and generations to come. I heard a pastor say this one time, years ago. His children were small. He said, you know, I am already praying for my grandchildren. I mean, his children were small. His children were four or five. He said, but one day they're going to be grown, they're going to have children, and I want to have prayed for them in case I die before they get here. And I thought, put some, put some prayers in the bank. Stock up. So that when they need it, you've got a reserve fund over here built up. Don't you think that's a good idea for us? Why don't you start praying? I know you pray for your children. Why don't you start praying for your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren? That we might leave a legacy that changes this world for God. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you that we can pray. That we can pray for our children, for our grandchildren, for our descendants. Lord, your word says that you punish the third and fourth generation of the sins of the Father, but you show mercy and love and grace to a thousand generations to those who love you. So God, allow us open our hearts so that we can love you. So that generations from this day forward might be blessed because we have a passion for you. And we make our prayer in Jesus' name. Happy Father's Day to you.